Hey guys, imagine enduring ME-CFS with all its debilitating symptoms like fatigue and brain fog and extreme sensitivities for over three decades and still managing to find your path to recovery. In this video, I'm so excited to share Dr. Eleanor Stein's recovery journey. She's over in Calgary in Canada, which incidentally is where I was born. So exciting. Uh, if you're new here, I'm Raylan, a fellow MECFS recoverer after 10 years of trial and error. <laughs> That's exactly why I started this channel, so that we can talk about what approaches people are finding helpful and keep hope alive in our incredible community. So you're gonna wanna watch or listen to the end of this one to hear Dr. Sign share not only the recovery approach that's working for her, but also lessons learned from working with thousands of patients over the years, specifically her focused work with people facing chronic fatigue conditions. So please join me in welcoming the amazing Dr. Stein. Dr. Stein, it's so great to have you here. Thank you for doing this today. You're welcome. I'm pleased to be here. So you have your own journey with this that got you interested in your professional practice with complex chronic illness. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. When I look back, I would say no one in their right mind at the beginning of medical school would say, you know what, I'm really excited. I want to enter a field that has no funding, no credibility and no jobs. And that's exactly what I ended up doing. And like most of us in the field, you know, most people in the field of ME, uh, CFS, fibromyalgia, long COVID, we got in here because of personal experience, not because of the glory. And most people either have a close loved one with the illness or they have it themselves. And I'm in that latter category. I was bopping along thinking I had the world at my feet. I was a second year psychiatry resident. And I got a little bit sick. It was nothing dramatic, kind of like they say, a mild flu-like illness. I had just traveled somewhere actually for a course, like on how to pass my exams. And I got back and I just thought, I don't feel great. I think I'm just going to lie down. And that was 35 years ago. Just never really lifted until, you know, we'll we'll talk about my more recent story where I've had improvement. But that lasted for 27 years where I really never had a good day. Wow. So was it a up and down journey with your health or did it stay somewhat consistent? You know, it was pretty consistent. Like I would say I was in the, you know, using the Karnofsky energy rating scale that a lot of people use to grade their severity. I was always in the moderate range. So kind of an energy level of about 50 and maybe towards the end up to about 70. I, I think I'm higher than that now, but for that 27 years, of course you have good days and bad days. Um, but I never really, I'm very lucky. I never went much below 40 and I unfortunately never went much above maybe 65, 70. So that meant I was able to continue working, but only part-time um, I had to limit everything I did, right? So work became what I could manage in the day. Um, a lot of resting, a, a lot less of all the things I enjoy. I'm, I was very physically active. And of course, that got decimated, you know, much less time for social interaction. I just had to do my work for those few hours a day and then rest, basically. And as a medical professional, having this happen to you, what was your understanding of what was happening? You know, it's funny. For some reason, so this was in 1989. Remember that the Holmes criteria came out in 1988. Now, for some reason, I had heard of them. I have no idea why, because they certainly weren't, you know, widely out there in the medical community. So I read the Holmes criteria, and they talk about the swollen lymph nodes and some of the flu-like symptoms and at that time, I didn't have those. I have subsequently developed them, but at that time I didn't. And so I read the criteria, I studied it pretty hard, and I thought, you know, I don't really know if this is what I have. I, I couldn't be sure. So I sought help. I went to one of the researchers who contributed to those early criteria, and she said I had depression. So basically, I went through the exact same experience as almost all of my patients of being misdiagnosed and therefore not having 
any uh, accurate knowledge upon which to act. How did that sit with you being told it was depression? Yeah, I didn't, it didn't sit very well. I was upset and discouraged. So it's not like I had no emotions about what was going on. I certainly did, but I wasn't, and I'm, I was in psychiatric training. So I really had already, you know, even two years into my training, of course, talked to many hundreds of patients with depression. And I knew that what I was experiencing was not the same as what they were experiencing, but you're stuck, right? There's no, literally in 1989, there was this one person in Canada who purportedly knew something. And unfortunately, she didn't, you know, validate what was going on with me for whatever reason. So I had nothing. So the next eight years was just horrible because, you know, like many newly diagnosed people, am I dying? Is this getting worse? Is this it for the rest of my life? You have all these questions that, and there was no one to supply the answers. So it was only in 1997 that I heard of another physician who coincidentally lives, uh, still lives, I think, in Calgary, who actually knew something. And I immediately called her, invited myself to sit in on her practice for a few weeks. And so this is eight years of suffering later. I saw patient after patient after patient come in you know, over that three weeks, I just was lying there on the couch. I was pretty sick. I wasn't even interacting. She just uh, was generous enough to allow me to lie there and listen to all these people. And after that three weeks, I knew for sure I had what they had. And she was a fount of information. So that's, you know, she was the one who clued in that I was hypermobile and had low blood pressure and would do way better with uh, electrolyte loading and Florinef and things like that. So, and she was willing to put me on some sleeping medication. So my life really took a huge turn for the better in 1997 when I got some, you know, met someone who actually knew something and could make sensible recommendations. Oh, yes. And she told me maybe the goal of running a marathon wasn't my best next move. <laughs> so she explained to me a lot about energy pacing which was a totally foreign concept and took me many years to really take on board. It's pretty incredible. You came across someone with that level of insight in, in 1997. I was, was very lucky. Time ago. It was a total <laughs> fluke. She was written up in some medical, you know, uh, public, like not a uh, peer reviewed journal, but kind of one of those medical magazines that a lot of us get over our desk. And my friend got that magazine, calls me up and said, Ellie, you have to read this article. You have to call this person. And that was really the start of it. Because once I, once I had that validation, once I had some tools to stabilize my health so that I was just that little bit better every day, then, and then I was super motivated to learn as much as I can, could. So then I really, like that was, what, 20... 28 years ago or something like that. So for that entire time, I've just thrown myself into learning as much as I can, both for me and later for my patients. So I learned on my own for several years before I felt I knew enough to open a practice and invite people in the community to work with me. So I did that in uh, mid 2000, you know, a few years after I had been trying to accumulate information and that's what I did for the next 25 years. So I know you have a ton of insight and experience uh, and information just from treating literally thousands of patients over the years mm -hmm. facing these sorts of you know, chronic complex illnesses. But I'd love to hear, and we're definitely going to dive into what is working um, with those patients. But for you personally, on your journey, what has been the most helpful getting you to where you are now? And would you consider yourself fully recovered or where, you, where are you on that journey today? That's such a great question. I would not consider myself fully recovered. I was thinking this morning how I would answer this question if you asked it, because this is a recovery channel and people want to hear miracle stories, right, of total recovery. What has recovered almost fully is my chemical sensitivities, which were severe and disabling my entire life. They're pretty much gone. My post-exertional malaise is pretty much gone. I can, you know, I can go exercise for a couple hours 
at a pretty vigorous level for a 60 year old. So I'm not saying I'm going to beat a 20 year old and feel fine, but I am accumulating some <laughs> new problems, musculoskeletal problems of aging. And I have a condition that might be an autoimmune condition. It's yet another one of these very hard conditions that nobody knows anything about. So I wouldn't say I'm totally out of the woods, like I have no health symptoms, but the ones I have, I'm not sure they're related to my ME. I feel like the ME is, I'm pretty much in recovery from that. And what do you have you found are the main things that allow right. you to make this progress to get where you are? You know, I've really thought long and hard about that over the course of my 37 or 35, 37 years of illness. You can imagine I've literally traveled over the, all over the world. I've been to hundreds of conferences, like every IACF SME conference since the beginning. Um, I've been to functional medicine conferences, environment, environmental medicine conferences and Lyme conferences and MCAS conferences, you know, all of the comorbidities. And a lot of the people in those fields recommend a lot of supplements, supplement protocols, some come and go, but they're always very prominent. And in preparation for my new subscription-based membership, which is starting this month, which is February when we're filming, I sent out an email to people like, what do you guys all want to learn so I can kind of orient myself? And a lot of people want to know about supplements. So if I have one message, it's that, you know what? Supplements have not helped me almost at all. Now, partially I'm not on supplements because I have these sensitivities probably diagnosed as MCAS. And so most of the things I take just make me feel worse rather than better. But even when I look back and I've spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can imagine over 40 years, that's a lot of you know money per year. It really adds up on testing, on um, going to visit specialists who have fancy protocols that I was hopeful would help. None of them have really helped. The thing that keeps me going right now is my diet. I'm on the paleo autoimmune diet. I'm say I follow it about 90 to 95% of the time. It's very hard to be on it 100% strictly, but the more I stick to it, the better I feel. That significantly impacts my energy and my fatigue. So if I go off of that diet, my energy starts plummeting. So that's why I say I don't think I'm recovered per se, because if I don't keep looking after myself, I have a strong suspicion I would fall back into many of the symptoms I had before. So I would say diet for me is key. I do use red and infrared light on a regular basis. Some people who know me uh, know that I've been a big advocate of that. I really watch my sleep behavior, I'll call it sleep hygiene and CBTI principles. I exercise pretty much every day. One of the reasons I retired from clinical practice is so that I would actually have more time for self-care because what I've learned is being stressed, being constantly busy, always having a to-do list that's longer than the amount of time available, I don't think was serving me well. And I want to live the next however many years I have left as well as possible. And to do that, I need time and space to breathe, to prepare the food, you know, that's healthy for me to do the exercises, to get outside walking, all of those kind of things have time for social time, fun things. That's what I really has, have found works. And therefore, that's really the centerpiece of one of the self-study courses that I offer, Pathways to Improvement. It's really teaching people all of those self-management strategies that are low to no cost, because even if there were a successful supplement or drug protocol, most people in the community cannot afford it because they've been sick for so long and they've used up all their financial resources. So the community that I'm really trying to reach out to right now are the people that don't have a knowledgeable healthcare profession, professional, the people that were in the position I was in or still really have been in most of my life. I've been having to figure it out for myself and people who are in financial hardship and don't have very much money to spend. I, there, 
the message I want to get across is that self-management is extremely biologically powerful. It's not a second best to some kind of fancy biomedical drug intervention. And the research for this is incredibly strong. The ways in which self-management impacts our biology, it changes our genetic expression, it changes our microbiome, it influences neuroplasticity, it changes our body in like objectively measurable ways. And many people don't get that message. They think, oh yeah, whatever, I'm waiting for the next big drug. The sad news is that I'll, I just finished watching like all the entire webinar series from the NIH roadmap and the entire uh, MECFS long COVID webinar series. So that was like 35, 40 hours of webinars. I watched the entire thing. And what I heard, there's incredibly smart people joining the field. It's very, very hopeful. Long COVID has brought a whole new batch of amazing researchers into the field. But a lot of the things they're reporting are quite far from ready for prime time. Like we're talking 5, 10, 15, 20 years out before we're going to know for sure if they work and before it's going to filter into the very conservative medical care system that changes incredibly slowly. So I'm just saying to people who are sick now, there's amazing things coming, but don't you want to get better now? And if you do, self-management is absolutely worth your time and effort. So you're mentioning self-management. What exactly does that mean? It means all the stuff that we can do ourselves that doesn't require a healthcare professional guiding us. Because yeah. why would I say that? Would that not be dangerous to try stuff yourself? Most of the self-management strategies that I teach and other people teach, I'm absolutely not the only one. They're things that require you to observe carefully and be mindful of your own body. So no doctor can tell you what time you should go to bed how, what your personal energy envelope is, what diet's going to be best for you, what stress management strategies are going to be the most effective. Those are examples of self-management tools. And you're the only one who can figure it out by basically noticing, becoming aware of your mental and cognitive and psychological state Figuring out what goals you want to accomplish, you might say, okay, my sleep is crappy, I really want to work on that. Reading up and getting information, for example, like uh, cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, which although the evil word cognitive behavior therapy in the title is really well-researched and very effective in most cases, and then those are all strategies you can implement yourself. There's online apps that will guide you. There's books that will guide you. And a doctor can't add too much to that unless you work through the whole thing and it's not working. That's where I would say you really want to seek out specialist help because maybe your situation has some unique factors that you're not, you know, you're not aware of because you're not a professional so I would say self-management are things you can do yourself that usually cost nothing that you can monitor and fine tune and figure out the best protocol for you. But always at the end, if it's not working, I would seek professional help because you may be missing something important. So for example, in the sleep example, you may have undiagnosed sleep apnea or some other sleep disorder. Very unlikely you're going to be able to figure that out yourself. I'm curious, you'd mentioned before red light therapy, and that is getting a ton of buzz lately. And I even have a device charging my living room that I've yet to use. And I think mostly because okay. I haven't had the chance to research it. So I don't even have the buy-in of like, what is this doing for me? So can yeah. you tell us a bit about the benefits yeah. from that? So it's been around actually for a pretty long time when I thought it just didn't even make sense, right? We learned nothing in medical school that light shined on the outside of the body could do anything other than maybe sunlight setting our circadian clock. So when I first read about it, I honestly was super skeptical. So I do, I did what I always do is I go to the back of the book and I look at all the references and I read them. And what I learned is red and infrared light in a certain wavelength, so not any wavelength and any color, just those wavelengths are actually absorbed by the mitochondria of the cell 
and they provide energy. I believe it's the the fourth stage of the oxidative metabolism. They provide energy so that the mitochondria make more ATP. So it's like free energy. It's it's too good to be true. That's how it sounded to me. Yeah. I bought my I did my training back in 2015, so you know, I'm almost 10 years into using it. It's great. Every ache and pain, I shine my red light on it and it gets better. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, can you hold on? I'm going to go get mine and put it on right now. It's been sitting there for <laughs> weeks gathering dust. I'm like, oh, I should really use now, this thing. What I'll, what I'll say about that, because I get questions all the time from people like, which device? You know, there's dozens yeah. out there. So here's what I'll say. I honestly don't know and I'm not promoting any given product. The product I have is called BioFlex Laser. It's a Canadian company out of Toronto. And it's the one that was discussed in Dr. Deutsch's uh, second book. So that's how I heard about it. So it's Canadian. It's in Toronto. I flew there. I took the course. I paid the money. I bought the system. It's super expensive. I wouldn't really recommend it for the average person. But I haven't honestly researched which uh, systems are really legitimate and which ones are going to give you enough photons, right? Okay. So it's all about the strength of the light. The light gives off photons. Those photons are absorbed by the mitochondria, by that, um, those oxidative metabolism enzymes, and they cause the mitochondria to produce more ATP than they would otherwise be able to do. Now, I was super skeptical because sometimes if you push the system like some supplement and drug protocols are trying to push the mitochondria to work harder. And in my experience over the last 30 years working with patients, that usually backfires. Like our mitochondria, if you read Dr. Navio's research, our mitochondria are shut down for a reason to protect us. And if you try to override them, most people end up crashing or many end up crashing. So I was very curious whether this would happen with red light. So when I first got my system, I did a little research study of 20 people, all different ages, severities, et cetera. I think they all came in for 10 sessions over five weeks. So two sessions a week, they all got the exact same protocol. They answered a bunch of questionnaires and I would say eight of the 10 people had an improvement and they mostly improved in energy pain, especially headache, because the protocol I gave them was around the neck. So around the neck, you're helping the head, but you're also kind of supercharging the blood that then flows to the rest of the body uh, and mood. So energy, pain and mood were the big three areas in which people improved. And I just have to say this because one of my learnings over my 35 years of practices were all different. So no matter how excited I am about a treatment like the red and infrared red light therapy. It didn't work for two of the people, right? So there's no treatment out there that works for everyone. And that's why self-awareness and mindfulness is so important. And having the courage to listen to what the big fad is out there and everyone's saying how amazing it is. And if you try it and it doesn't work for you, it's not your fault. It just, or that you didn't try hard enough. It's just that maybe it's not the right solution. Or that there's no hope for you. <laughs> it's just... well, No, I won't say there's no hope. You, you might want to yeah. try. Oh, I see. You're saying you don't want people to think that. Yes, like, absolutely. Like, no, Rayla, no. <laughs> think it, yeah, yeah. There is no hope for you. That is the message right. that I have. Please don't out. come to that conclusion. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. End of video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how I can feel in those moments. You're like, oh, it works for everybody. And then yes. you try it and it doesn't work. And it can just level you like, oh my yeah. goodness. Like, what is wrong with me that this isn't working for me? But there are so many different, all different. treatments and so many different things to do. So that is the great news. There's and many we do have that not everything works for everyone. So yeah, it makes sense. Many, many, many things don't work for me. Like everybody yeah. over the years, mitochondrial cocktails, big thing. Try this, try this does nothing for me. It's zero zip, except put a hole in my pocketbook. <laughs> so as I'm sure you've seen, you know, in our community and the recovery videos, there is a lot of talk about mind body medicine and how that contributes to healing. So what is your experience or your um, take on that? So you know what, I've come full circle on this for most of my 
medical life, I was a hardcore biomedical believer. And if anyone came to me and said, you know, you should try meditation, breathing, I don't know, energy medicine, all that stuff, I was like, <laughs> not for me. What I've learned uh, through reading research, so I'm, I'm a scientist, I really kind of go by what I read that's in peer-reviewed journals. And I've just been reading over the past few years, this incredible body of literature in the kind of general um, area called mindfulness or mindset. And basically, there, there are these amazing experiments that were done to show that what we believe, even if we're not aware of it, has a massive biological effect on our body. So just to give you one example, there's literally dozens of these studies and they're phenomenal. So one of my favorite ones is the milkshake study because it really makes the point clearly. So a bunch of people were given what they were told were two different milkshakes. Actually, it was the same milkshake on two different occasions. On one occasion, they were told it was a fatty, decadent, high calorie, like 600 calorie milkshake. Enjoy. On the second occasion, the exact same people were given the exact same milkshake, but they were told it was a nutritional diet shake with about 150 calories. Sometime after, mm -hmm. I don't know, half an hour out or hour after the milkshake, they all gave a blood test and their ghrelin level was measured. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. It's high when we're hungry and it mm -hmm. goes down when we're full. The people who told they got the really high calorie milkshake, their ghrelin plummeted. The people, the same people on a different day who were told they got the nutritious low calorie shake, their ghrelin just went down a little bit. So I love this study because we can't control ghrelin. Like if you put me in a lab and say, okay, Ellie, bring your ghrelin level down, I wouldn't be able to do it. But my unconscious mindset, knowing, oh, Yum, this is a filling, high, high fat, high calorie milkshake, and my ghrelin level goes down. So that gives, that's why I think those kind of studies are really proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that our mind and our body are one and that we are best advised. I've been doing this myself since I've been studying neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity practice really coaches you to observe and optimize your mindset, right? To not complain, not whine. Try to focus on the life that you want to have instead of the life that you're misery, uh, having misery in right now. And it's really helped me. Like I'm a much happier, more upbeat person because I'm spending more time thinking about positive things that I'm working towards. And whether that has had a direct impact on my health, I can't say, but bonuses, I'm happier. Yeah, it's, it comes up in interview after interview after interview, and it's just, it seems hard to deny that this is having a significant impact. When people incorporate some element of this into their recovery, it seems, it yeah. seems to go a really long way. Like, I kind of talk about alignment in my courses. So I'm saying to someone, you could be doing all this self-management stuff, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, it's hopeless, I'm never going to get better. And medical professionals are often guilty of helping people come to these conclusions. I used to do it. I feel very bad. I used to say to people things like, you know, it's called chronic disease for a reason because it's chronic, right? That was not a good message. Once I started recovering and listening to recovery stories like on Raylan's channel, I'm now giving people very different messages. I'm, I'm saying it is absolutely possible to recover. It's good. The path is going to be different for every person. Um, you know, in my, I call my approach a buffet approach rather than a recipe approach. So there's some programs out there that say, do this, do this, do this, do this. And you're all the same and you're all going to get better in the same way. I've been in practice 35 years. I know that's not true. And so my approach is to give people a ton of tools and give them the credit for figuring out which ones are going to work for them. Just gave me goosebumps. I was just thinking of all the people I've interviewed and m most of them went into their doctors and were told some version of, you're probably never going to be get better. You just need to learn to live with this. And over and over and over, I hear, you know, what a negative impact they had, uh, that yeah. had on their journey initially. So it's just so amazing that you're out there helping people um, and that people are going to their doctor and getting this message in instead. So, yeah. 
I hope so. I hope it's increasingly true. So it's incredible that you're out here providing support for people. We have millions of people around the world who are facing these conditions and really need the help. So uh, I'm sure people would love to know, you know, what your approach looks like, what's different about your approach and what you have available for people for support um, who are facing these conditions. Okay, thanks, Raylan, for that opportunity. I would like to, I have quite a bit available, both paid and unpaid. So I just like to encourage people to go to my website and probably Raylan will post the link. So it's www.eleanorsteinmd.ca. And if you go to the top, I've got a tab called free resources. And there are a ton of free resources, including a bunch of talks that I've given, access to my blogs, audio files, list of all my publications so you can check me out that I'm actually a legitimate doctor and I've actually published stuff. And then I have another tab, which is my store. So my what I offer kind of falls into three categories. I have self-study courses, like the Pathways course that I mentioned before. I have another one called Healing Through Neuroplasticity, which is teaching all the neuroplastic skills that I've learned over the past 10 years. So those are self-study. You can join whenever you wish. You can work at your own pace. There is a supported community. So you have the opportunity to interact with the other participants and ask questions and ideally post your successes and your wins. Then I have a section called live, uh, live courses. And the one that's just launching that I'm really excited about, I'm calling Live with Dr. Stein. So it's a subscription-based membership. And every two weeks, I'm going to uh, share information that I'm learning in the cr chronic complex disease space. And the particular angle I'm taking, I've been kind of coming to over the past few years, as I'm reading the biochemistry, right, the deep biology of chronic complex diseases, I'm learning that there's a lot in common between our the diseases in our community and other chronic diseases. Of course, we have all our unique characteristics, but some of the underlying biology is similar. And even more interesting, it's similar to the biology of aging, the so-called 12 hallmarks of aging. The reason this is, I think, really exciting is that I shared before that although research in ME and FM and environmental sensitivities is really exploding, we're still many years out from having more than a handful of evidence-based approaches. But in the chronic disease field in general and in the longevity field, they are way ahead. And there's tons of studies with hundreds or even thousands of people showing what kind of self-management strategies work. And again, interestingly enough, in chronic disease in general and in longevity field, it's all self-management that is the most powerful. So this is what I'm going to bring together every two weeks. I'm also starting an expert webinar series. I'm super excited. I already have the first speakers signed up. So they're going to be experts in the field. Some are going to be hardcore scientists. Some are going to be clinicians. And some are going to be what we would call more complementary practitioners like Qigong, acupuncture, um, so really bringing together as broad a knowledge base as possible because everybody's different. Some people are going to get off on the science. Some people are really looking forward to the more complementary approaches. And all of those sessions, you're going to walk away with actionable strategies. And this is a part of the Live with Dr. Stein subscription? Yes. So thank you. If you become a, a subscribe member to my Live, you'll be able to access all of the expert webinars for free. That's included in the membership, but you don't have to join the membership. You could, if you wish, just, you know, pick and choose the expert uh, webinars that are interest to you. This sounds incredible. I want to sign up. <laughs> you are welcome to do so. <laughs> Yeah, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on the channel is I just I knew people were going to appreciate. And not only do you have the personal experience, extensive first decades of experience mm -hmm. of living with these sorts of conditions, but you also have the medical training and the background and the clinical experience of treating patients and seeing how that's going. And all of this wealth of information and insight you're putting out there for people. And for those of you watching, I really encourage you to look at Dr. Stein's website because everything she puts out is very affordable. She's making it very attainable. She said she's really aiming to reach people who are tapped out in resources and, you know, that's, which is 
most of us, <laughs> unfortunately, who go through this. Yeah, so thanks for mentioning that, Raylan. It's really mo- like those of you who know me, I'm really not in this for the money, right? I really want to get the information out there. I feel like I've been incredibly fortunate that I have recovered to the point where I can travel all over the world and live the life. You know, I have a van. I'm uh, Most of the year, I'm going to be doing these kind of interviews from my van using my Starlink so that I can have the best of both worlds. And I'm so grateful to have that opportunity. And I want to share what I've learned so that hopefully some other people can join me out there. Absolutely incredible. All right. Well, Dr. Stein, thank you so much uh, for this today. This has been incredibly informative. Uh, I know people are really going to appreciate it. And just for those of you watching, Dr. St- we have some plans to have Dr. Stein back on the channel because she's got some really big things on the go that we haven't even <laughs> touched on here. Super exciting. Not allowed to talk about it yet, but um, just game changers for the world of MECFS and long COVID recovery. Um, just so much, um, so many great things happening. So thank you, Dr. Stein, for being here today. And I really look forward to having you back, um, hopefully soon, to dive into some of these things. Thanks, Raylan. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. And I just reach out to your members. My bottom line message is there is hope. Don't give up. If 17 things don't work, try the 18th. Absolutely. And also a shout out to Bernard Martson. Thank you so much, Bernard, for joining the channel. I appreciate the support. If if you're watching and you want to become a channel member, you get access to some perks uh, and little things that no one else gets. Just click that join button below the video. So thank you again, Dr. Stein. Thank you to those of you watching. I am sending so much love to you. Whatever you're facing, keep at it. Keep going. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. And I hope to see you um, in this next one.